So hi, I'm Tom Evans and welcome to another edition of The Zone Show. And today I'm really honoured and thrilled to be speaking with Dr. John C. Taylor. How are you, John? I'm fine, thank you very much. Lovely. Well, I suspect today we're going to explore a few of the zones. Certainly I'd like to explore the time zone with you. I know you're passionate about time. But also I want to explore the entrepreneurial zone because you're a, a man of many talents. You're a, an inventor, innovator, an entrepreneur philanthropist and also orologist. Would that be okay with you? Yes, that's fine, yes. So so for people that don't know you, John, um, you're, um, I would say, uh, just a consummate inventor. Um, how do you how do you get your ideas? Where do your ideas come from? How do you get into that zone where that creativity just flows through you? Well, usually it's hearing other people's problems. And if I hear a problem, I can either solve it in 15 seconds or I can't solve it. I find that's how my brain works. Um, and I'm a great believer in telepathy. And if you're uh, in, a, in a, a technical meeting and somebody is complaining about a problem and in 15 seconds I can immediately see the solution, I believe in telepathy and I immediately try and think of something else so nobody else picks up on the same brain waves. <laughs> I find that if I see a problem, I can find an answer to it either straight away within a few seconds or it doesn't matter how long I think of it after that, um, I generally don't find a solution. Well, that is phenomenal. So is the the 15 seconds then significant in some way? Um, Yes, I I think um, it's the other side of your brain because when you're in a, a conversation and people mention something, you don't stop and think, oh, I wonder what the solution to that is. You're, you're part of a conversation, and, and yet your, your brain processes information um, after it's been received and um, will then pop out and say, oh, the solution to that is this. But it's not that you're consciously trying to think of a solution often. It's simply the solution pops up ask for and if you're there then to receive it, it it's if it's in a meeting i try and suppress those thoughts then take them away and uh, process the information more carefully and unlike some of the more famous inventors maybe like steve jobs or edison um, many people are probably using one of your inventions daily but might not have heard of you what sort of things have you come up with that are in common usage these days well, usually people talk about uh, kettle controls, and I've spent um, many years designing uh, automatic kettle controls and uh, set up a little factory here on the Isle of Man in 1981, specializing in kettle controls, and um, I retired in 1999, and in 2004, um, the, the new owners of the, of the business uh, had a party to sip up, celebrate selling a billion kettle controls uh, from a standing start in 1981. That is amazing. So a billion people on the planet, or more, are enjoying a cup of tea or coffee using one of your inventions. That is a phenomenal t- achievement for how many people you've touched. <laughs> um, and then in the 1960s, I designed a little uh, motor protector, and um, that was for a, a company in in my father had sat, uh, formed in Buxton in Derbyshire, Otter Controls Limited. And there was a, uh, one of my friends who was a pilot um, who had passed away, and there was a memorial service to him. And I went up uh, back to Buxton, and after the service in the uh, uh, reception afterwards, uh, talking to people from the company, um, I said, oh, I was looking on the internet and I saw that we're still making the Otter G, uh, the little motor protector. And the answer was, oh, yes, yes, it's still one of our best lines. So I said, well, how many do you think you've made? Uh, well, he said, uh, well, before you left the company, it was running at 150,000 a week. Um, by the uh, 80s, it was 250,000 a week. By the 90s and the noughties, it peaked at about 350,000 a week. He said it's down a bit now to about 250,000 a week still. But uh, yeah, it's still one of our best lines. 
uh, he said you could you could say on an average for uh, since the the 1960s, nearly 50 years, um, it's averaged 250,000 a week. That is amazing. And what does the automotive control control? Uh, electric motors. It's a safety device inside the electric motor, and uh, the actual motor current goes through the bimetal. And being an engineer, you'd appreciate that the resistance of the bimetal. Um, is probably higher than the copper windings, and that when the motor stalls, the current increases by the squ- and the heating by the square of the current, so that you can actually make the bimetal switch off the the electric current uh, even before the, the the windings have got hot. And so, with the problem, what what, what sort of motors then uh, would this be controlling? Is it industrial or is it uh, domestic? Well, yes, both. Uh, all. Um, the, the, the biggest market is for um, motor cars. Um, a modern motor car uh, will have 20 electric motors on it, and each one has to be protected um, so it can't catch fire. Um, if, if it was stalled, uh, frozen up, uh, and you forget there's uh, not only windscreen wipers motors, there's now headlight wiper motors, squirter motors, seat lift motors, suspension leveling motors um, and the, the list just keeps uh, I- expanding and you, you will have I say literally uh, a couple of dozen electric motors in even uh, a medium-sized car these days. So when you studied natural scientists at, at uh, Cambridge University John did you think that you were going to touch so many people's lives in a kind of uh, clandestine kind of way because most people that drive a car or boiler a kettle, uh, well, maybe know your name. Well, now exactly the opposite. Um, w- when I was in Cambridge, not only academically, um, but it's a wonderful opportunity to do all sorts of things. And I was determined to try things that um, I'd never done before. Um, at 16, I'd already gone solo flying a glider. And I thought, well, I've been there. Um, much as I enjoy gliding, um, I'll try and do things which um, I haven't done before. And I took up rock climbing, mountaineering, um, rowing, uh, and of course, girls. <laughs> and the, uh, this led to natural sciences, to geology, and I was lucky enough to go on the 1958 expedition to uh, Spitsbergen. And we we had a fantastic um, summer. Um, I never slept in a bed. I never had a roof over my head. Um, We were sledge hauling uh, provisions across the ice caps. And uh, we were the last of what we'll call heroic exploration because we had no radios. We had no rescue. uh, We had no communication with the outside world. We we had no aerial maps, um, and so we're actually making uh, geographical, topographical maps and then putting the geology onto the topographical maps. Um, it was the most wonderful experience, and I just loved it. And I thought, what better to do in the future than do a PhD in Antarctica? Um, and so I went, um, as I graduated, I went to uh, the a professor of geology in Birmingham University, who at the time was coordinating a lot of the research in Spitsbergen, and he sent me to FIDS, Falkland Isles Dependency Survey, for our sponsorship. And I went to London and had two days of interviews and aptitude tests, and finally um, every one of the uh, people who interviewed me tried to talk you out of going, say how awful it was going to be, and how um, the the rations were boring and there was no air flights, so you had to wait every year and there's possibility you would even get a postcard. Um, If the ice was there, you might be stuck, all the the bad things. Um, And uh, I I sort of thought, well, that that sounds fun. And uh, the, the director finally said, okay, well, he would agree to sponsor me. So I went home and told my mother that I wouldn't see her for three years. And I don't think she was best pleased. I explained that I'd have to have my uh, wisdom teeth taken out um, just in case. And I had to have my appendix taken out just in case. And uh, 
She put a brave face on it. And a week later, the envelope popped in through the letterbox from Her Majesty's Service Fids. And the letter from the director confirmed that he agreed to sponsor me. And then there was a new paragraph beginning with the word but. But I regret to inform you that the government has cut all our funding and we are unable to uh, honor our commitments. We wish you all the best in any future career you may choose. Oh dear, and you couldn't have your appendix put back in there. Well, of course, it was only a week, so I hadn't had them out yet. <laughs> oh, fine, I was lucky. <laughs> Fantastic. But I hear you're actually going down to Antarctica shortly. Well, this is this is true, yes, because um, uh, I've always wondered what my life would have been um, if I'd become an academic and studied glaciology or geology. Um, I've certainly always been in love with the polar regions, and uh, I just loved it. And so when I retired, one of the first things I did was go on a... Um, a uh, exploration cruise to Antarctica and uh, yes I'm going back again this year in a, a smallish ship with uh, 100 passengers and they have 10 zodiacs and you get 10 passengers five on each side um, going ashore or going around the uh, looking at the the seals or the penguins or or what or the whales or whatever well when I, uh, the opportunity came up to, to have you on the Zone show, uh, John, and I heard that you're going to an- Antarctica, and obviously I knew about your your absolute fascination with all things temporal. It got me thinking about someone standing right on the South Pole or right on the North Pole. Is that if you're right on the South Pole, you're actually in all time zones at the same time, aren't you? Definitely, yes. Yeah, so if you just walk like one step in any direction... You can go into any time on the Earth. And change the date. Yeah, exactly. So I was wondering, this is just a bit, because I know you, you, you I, I sense you've got a sense of humour about time, because anyone that looks at the Chrono page can just see the fun in it, apart from the, the, the engineering excellence and, and innovation. It's, it's just got humour all over it. If you were to walk backwards in it, just step out by a foot from the South Pole and sort of go around the opposite direction from the Earth, would you go back in time? Well, you could go back a day in time, certainly, yes. Yeah, isn't that just phenomenal? Because we're, we're all kind of captured by this thing called time, and we? we? We've kind of invented it to, to make us turn up at the right place at the right time so that, you know, when we said we'd speak today, I was on the end of Skype when you called and you were at the other end when, I, when we watched you speak. So it's kind of convenient, but we've also been entrapped by it in some way. Well, very much so. I, I feel that uh, many people say that the invention that has affected humanity most is the wheel. Um, Well, the wheel has become the servant of humanity. I think the clock is the opposite, that mankind is now controlled by the clock, so that the, the invention which has changed most humanity is the clock, not the wheel. And it's time that now rules you from the clock. Indeed, and I love that phrase that the only, there's, the only thing in nature that beats the second is the thoughts of a person watching the clock. <laughs> well, I, I, that's uh, uh, not quite true because uh, my heart uh, beats quite happily, 60 beats um, every every minute, uh, controlled by a pacemaker. So, uh, Oh, is that right? Yeah, but that's slightly unnatural in a way, isn't it? But uh, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> Phenomenal. So, John, the, the, the chronophage, this, this is how I first came across you. I saw this incredible video of this um, this clock. I wouldn't, it's not really a clock. Is, is, it, um, is it a chronometer? Is it a chirometer? What, what is it? Well, it's a piece of modern art, I think. Uh, yeah. that, the, that was the objective. Um, I'm a great believer that um, if you complain about something, it's no good complaining. You've got to be able to do something that's better so that uh, when people complain about modern art rather than joining in, um, I try to think, well, what could I do which would be completely modern and different and yet um, entertain and, as you say, have a sense of humor? But, but also um, time is not on my side. Um, I'm almost twice as old as you are, 
and time changes as you get older that you don't think of um, time as coming to an end. Um, when you're 78, you have to realize that your time is limited. And, and so that the chronophage not only, I wanted to show a, a sense of humor, as you say, but also to uh, have a slightly sinister side of time that uh, people don't think about, and yet, Time is not on your side. It's not on anybody's side. It goes on relentless. And um, in the end, it catches up with you or you catch up with it and father time. So the, the thoughts on the chronophage, yes, it was to produce something which was modern art, which entertained um, with a sense of humor and uh, a, a bit of a message going into it as well. Yeah, because the, the, the escapement, which is normally hidden inside a clock mechanism, this is the thing that sort of makes it almost drives the clock forward. This is very explicitly on the outside of the clock. And in a very sort of ironic way, it's also eating time, isn't it, at the same, at the same time? Yes. Being an inventor, I never want to do what anybody else has ever done before. So that uh, when I started thinking about a clock... Um, I tried to think, well, how could I make a new sort of clock? And one of my heroes from the past is John Harrison, who made the first clocks that could go to sea and so that you could find your longitude. And we're all indebted even today for GPS. It's the same thing. It's finding your, where you are through using time. It's just an extension. Um, a more accurate extension as well of what John Harrison did. And part of his, one of his early inventions was to invent a, an escapement which was virtually frictionless. And the escapement in any watch or in, in any clock has to do two things. Uh, first of all, it has to allow the, the pendulum or the balance wheel uh, to control the release of the pent-up energy of either the spring or the weight or uh, the battery or whatever it is. And the, 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 the other thing the escapement then has to do is to keep the oscillator, which can be the, the pendulum or the balance wheel, um, maintaining its constant swing. The amplitude has got to remain constant um, to help keep keep the time accurately. Um, and so the, the escapement does the two things. It allows the, uh, the time base to be controlled and release the energy uh, in a clock a second at a time. Or, and when, when the oscillation is taking place, the escapement has to give the pendulum an impulse every swing to overcome the air resistance. Um, and John Harrison invented the first escapement that didn't require oiling because oil was the, the Achilles heel of, of all clocks. Because in the, uh, in, in the development of um, uh, lubrication, the only oils that were available at this period were natural oils. Um, petroleum oils hadn't been invented and most natural oils dry out. If you think of linseed oil, it's paint. It may, when you watch it, it may seem to take a long time to dry. Hmm. But uh, oils, are, it, natural oils, um, do congeal. And if, or uh, if you say like goose grease, um, if you put it in the fridge, it hardens completely. So that using a lubricant for a clock going to sea and going through the tropics and being um, in the hold of a ship at 40 C, even 50 C, um, and then going um, into the polar regions, minus 25, minus 30 C, there's a huge temperature change for, for the oil. And um, this was one of the main difficulties to overcome in, in, in any clock. In fact, the London clock makers knew it was impossible and they didn't even try to make a clock which would go to sea, 
whereas John Harrison um, believed that nothing was impossible if you could find a way to solve it. And being a carpenter, he set off and made initially um, some wooden clocks. Um, and to reduce the friction, he invented a grasshopper escapement. And the grasshopper escapement required no oil. And most people, well, let's, let's start the sentence again. Some people have heard of John Harrison, knowing that having seen the, the, the TV films uh, about longitude, and uh, all the recent discussions of the Longitude Act, because it's the uh, uh, 300th anniversary of the Longitude Act uh, this year, 2014, from the 1714 Longitude Act, and the exhibition um, taking place at the present time in Greenwich. So John Harrison is known by comparatively a uh, number of people, but of those about 1% know about a grasshopper and about 1% of 1% of 1% have ever seen a grasshopper escapement or even try to understand how it works. So I thought it would be a great tribute to John Harrison um, to turn his escapement inside out and um, put it on so that everybody could see how a grasshopper escapement worked. The other reason why I wanted to do a tribute to John Harrison was, um, who invented bimetal? John Harrison. Seriously? He invented bimetal um, to temperature compensate um, his sea clocks. And I'd spent my life using bimetal, and in the most of my life, I didn't, I didn't know who had invented it. it, never crossed my mind. Uh, and there, when I went into more detail in horology, I discovered that John Harrison had invented bimetal. He, he was a prolific inventor, um, even though he was a carpenter and had no technical training. Um, he invented things like the uh, caged uh, roller bearing, which is, is used in hundreds of millions every day in everything you can think of, washing machines, motor cars, they all have caged um, bearings um, with, with balls and rollers. Um, and most people don't know that either. So trying to bring it all together, um, I decided that I would try and turn the Harrison Grasshopper escapement inside out and make it the feature of the clock. And then because of time, time certainly has a beginning, does it have an end? Um, it began with the Big Bang and then the, the Big Bang radiates out from the center. Time starts from the center from that moment. And uh, so that the dial of the clock, the face of the clock, I had ripples of time coming out from the center of the universe. But if you throw a stone into a pond, um, you get a splash. And I thought, well, if time started in the Big Bang, perhaps there was also a splash coming out and so that there's a, another parallel universe splashing out um, um, just as a vestigial start on, in the centre of the clock. That's phenomenal. And, um, and I guess you can see your life and John Harrison's life as, as, as ripples on that clock. You know, you think of just the timelines, how you're, you're both connected in thought and in deed uh, in terms of the work that you've both been doing. Well, I would love to... Uh, um, be associated with John Harrison. Yes, I think uh, he certainly changed the world. So for people that uh, want to see this clock, uh, the, 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 the chronophage itself is in your alma mater, Cambridge. It's on the outside of um, Corpus Christi College, uh, looking down King's Parade onto uh, King's College Chapel. And King's College Chapel has been there for 500 years or something like that. And it's been the visitor attraction in Cambridge for all that, that period. It's now been uh, superseded because more visitors come to look at the Corpus Clock than, than look at the uh, uh, King's College Chapel. And if people can't make it to Cambridge, then there's a fantastic YouTube video, which I'll link to at the bottom of this uh, this podcast, that you show the inner workings of the, the clock as well. And I love the way that you uh, made the, the light go around the, the clock. As an electronic engineer, 
I would have done it with electronics, but you've done it with mechanics. It's very strange how two different minds will approach the same uh, issue. Yes, yes, it, it's it's also interesting because most people don't realise how it works. And John Harrison, in, in the innards of his clocks, spent many, many painstaking hours making them absolutely beautiful and very, very clever and beautiful parts. And, of course, nobody sees them. It's only a repairer, um, who, and I suppose... There's only three people who've ever taken uh, one of Harrison's chronometers apart, uh, cleaned it and put it back together again in, in its 300-year uh, life. But um, he, he painstakingly made um, these not only mechanical ingenuity uh, he used, but also he made them of great beauty which was, is never seen. And up to a point, um, I think the, uh, the mechanism inside the clock is, is very similar that uh, nobody actually appreciates um, how it works. And I hear the public can actually see some of your amazing collection of timepieces. Yes, some of the uh, timepieces are, are exhibited in the National uh, Maritime Museum uh, for a part of this longitude celebration that they have. And... Uh, uh, I actually am very lucky. I managed to acquire Harrison's own personal regulator uh, with a grasshopper escapement in it. And he realized that before he could make a sea clock, he had to make a land clock because in, in his day and age, um, there was no radio, there was no telephone. And so time uh, was local and tended to be just a sundial to set your clock by. But you, you're very difficult to read a minute um, of time on a sundial. So to calibrate a sea clock, um, he needed uh, a land clock, uh, which he could use as his time base. And he set off to design and build two precision um, long case clocks. And the first thing he wanted to do was um, do away with the oil and he'd already had trouble with another clock which he'd made for Brocklesby Hall uh, where the oil on the escapement um, was causing um, changes in the friction with the change of the temperature and the Brocklesby clock was always stopping and so he designed the grasshopper escapement with its uh, not no requirement for oil to get over this problem. And he used his new grasshopper escapement inside these two regulators, which he built. And he also then, uh, at a time when the Royal Society in London was beginning to have learned uh, discussions on the expansion of materials, um, he determined that um, the expansion of three lengths of steel was the same as two lengths of brass. And so he, he invented then this uh, gridiron escapement where the expansion of the, um, the steel was counteracted by the expansion of the brass so that the bob remained in the same length in space, although the, the rods expanded and contracted um, around it. And to prove that the temperature compensation was working, um, he built two of these clocks and put them um, in different rooms. And he would, in the winter, bank up the fire in, the, in his drawing room and get it really hot in there. And so the clock was affected by sort of 30, 35 Celsius. Whereas in the dining room, he'd have the other clock and he'd open the windows and um, uh, not have a fire, so that it went, got down to freezing. And then he would listen to the, the pendulums and the ticks, and he could then very, very quickly um, de determine if one clock was going faster or slower than the other, because its temperature compensation between the two wasn't correct. And he would then adjust the temperature compensation um, because it wasn't exactly three lengths of steel with exactly two lengths of brass, 
um, he, he also had what he called a tin whistle, which um, allowed him to adjust the sort of last 15, 20% of the expansion and to change it, uh, change the ratio until the, the actual rods that he had uh, completely balanced out the, the change in length of the pendulum so that um, it was unaffected by uh, temperature changes and he could then use the same sort of a system in a C clock. Um, so that's how, how he made his land clocks. And as I mentioned, on a sundial, you can only read it to, um, to something like a minute. Well, that's, he was trying to do things to a fraction of a second. And, and the way he, he found the time to a fraction of a second to calibrate his land clock was by the rotation of the Earth. That is incredible. And uh, most people think that the Earth revolves once in 24 hours. Um, that's only with relation to the sun, and that's the only the average day. Most things that you're taught in school about time is wrong. Uh, there has never, ever in the history of the universe been one uh, day on Earth which is exactly, exactly, exactly 24 hours. 24 hours is only the average um, over many years. Uh, the, the, the Earth itself uh, tends to spin usen reasonably uniformly. He was observing uh, a star in, in, at night and waiting for it to disappear behind his neighbor's chimney. And one rotation of the Earth is actually 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4.09 seconds. And so that he then had a, a time base um, with which he could calibrate his land clocks by watching uh, the rotation of the Earth, by watching the stars. <laughs> and uh, he was an incredibly astute man that most people think, well, if you had a, a grandfather clock with hours, minutes, and seconds, that he could only measure time to a second. But he used to watch the pendulum, and of course this pendulum going from one side to the other takes a second. And so he then calibrated in between the, the swing um, and marked it in tenths of a second. So he could actually uh, get the time uh, to make his clocks um, keep as a time base. He could measure the time uh, to a tenth of a second. Wow. And so if you go back just a few hundred years, then not many people had a, a, a clock and very few people would have anything like a pocket watch. So now we've, now we've got clocks all over our houses in the same way you've got motors all over the, the motor car. How do we escape from this uh, this entrapment that we put on ourselves of having this time prison imposed upon ourselves? I think it's very difficult to escape. It, it's it's the way of humanity now. Um, any civilized society is controlled by the clock. And uh, yes, you can escape and go and live on a desert island and not be controlled by it, but. You have your own body clock inside. And I discovered when I was in Spitsbergen, um, it never went dark. Um, the sun just went round and round and round. And so you could very easily um, think, well, I'll eat when I'm hungry and I'll sleep when I'm tired. And you would, if you did that, you would keep going for about 30 hours. Um, and then you'd have a sleep, and then you'd keep going for about 20 hours, and then you'd have a sleep, and then you just disintegrate. But you have to keep a reasonably in line with 24 hours um, um, to be efficient, because your own internal body clock um, does that. And um, if, you, if you don't uh, feed yourself regularly, then you upset your own uh, internal mechanisms and uh, your body just doesn't like it and your brain in the end says, I've had enough of this and you, you tend just to uh, go to bed and vegetate. 
So the, the astronauts on the International Space Station then, who have a, a sunrise and sunset every 90 minutes, it must play havoc with their bodies when they go up there and when they come back down. Well, I think you'll find that they, they keep um, depending um, where they're from. Um, if, if it's all uh, European people on it, they would keep European time and um, so that they would uh, know exactly using ordinary watches where uh, where they were and many many jobs people don't see natural daylight at all um, they're just in an office without a uh, being able to look out of a window and, and so that they again are not affected by um, the sun's coming and going so that the astronauts are no more different than a person stuck in a in an office um, it may be slightly more confusing to, to see the sun going up and down, um, but I'm sure the astronauts can treat it just as a way of their life as um, a computer in an office who never sees the sun at all. Very wise. So what's the future then for the chronophage? Um, where, are you, where are you going to take it? How are you going to uh, spread the, the word about time around the world? Um, well, we've just finished uh, a chronophage for a, a private collector um, in America, and we're taking a, a chronophage clock with a, gra with, a, with a grasshopper escapement, which has got a dragon um, to Shanghai, and so that uh, um, I'm, I'm showing uh, the chronophage clock uh, in China. Wonderful. And can you ever see the chronophage clock uh, ever being scaled down and perhaps made into uh, an app or even end up on one of these smart watches that people like Apple and Android are bringing out nowadays so that it can be in the hands of uh, normal human beings that haven't got spare two or three million pounds to spend? <laughs> yes, why not? Yes. Um, it, it's uh, the, the way you have time racing round the dial. Um, there's no reason why it shouldn't be on a, on a smaller uh, scale. You're quite right. Fantastic. Well, John, it's been absolutely amazing to uh, to, to discuss this uh, topic of time with you and, and innovation in general. And uh, uh, it's been a real thrill to to uh, an honour to speak to someone uh, who's got such um, depth and breadth of knowledge. Um, and so, could we make a date for the future to come back on the Zone Show again? I'd be lovely to speak to you again and investigate some of these things in more detail. Would be my pleasure. Yes, I'd enjoy it. And if people want to find out about you and the chronophage, where's the best place for them to discover you? Well, if you put the um, anything into Google about the chronophage, um, you'll be served up with very many links. Indeed. Well, great to speak to you, John. Real honour, and I wish you every success in all the things that you're going to do. And I'm sure there's going to be a few world-shattering inventions to come from your marvellous brain yet. <laughs> Thank you. I hope so. A real pleasure. Thank you, John. So if you want to find out more about John and his amazing work, go to his website, www.johnctaylor.com. That's Taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R. And you can find some of the timepieces from his personal collection at the National Maritime Museum until the 5th of January, 2015. I'm Tom Evans, and thanks for listening to The Zone Show.